So welcome everyone to another one in our Transforming Assessment webinar series. And today we're very pleased to be able to have Dirk uh, Ithinpala from Deakin University, actually recently uh, at Deakin University. So uh, Dirk, congratulations on your appointment there. Um, Dirk has been at Open Universities Australia and that's actually where I uh, saw Dirk uh, very recently um, there. So Dirk's well known and he's published uh, quite extensively in the area of learning analytics and assessment online and uh, he'll tell you a little bit about that and, and let you know the, um, he's an editor for a series as well which I'm sure he'll tell us about. So today Dirk is going to talk about the automated semantic knowledge visualization and assessment. So Dirk, I shall hand over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, I hope everybody can hear me clear. Otherwise I'm, I try to um, fix my uh, setup here. Um, so maybe this is the first interaction you can start and um, give some signs or um, whatever you have handy and, um, and let me know if, if this is working for you on, on the other side. So welcome to this um, session and um, I'm, I'm really happy to, to be part of this series because I think all the topics have been so far very interesting and, and very diverse and broad. And so it's just a great series and I, I want to thank Job and, and Matthew for preparing this and, and, and giving me the availability to, uh, to really present my work as well. So the title Automated Semantic Knowledge Visualization and Assessment, this is basically um, a summary of, of a work um, I did over the last 10 years. So starting to think about automating assessment and, uh, and also making more sense out of assessment in terms of feedback and scaffolds out of these automated assessments. And so I came into several research projects and, and tried to develop a, um, an understanding from a cognitive psychology uh, perspective into assessment, but also trying to use my skills in, in, in all these uh, computer-based uh, technologies and bring and join this together. So joining education technology with cognitive psychology, basically. So this is the summary um, of my work I've been doing in the last 10 years. And um, today I want to present you a, a tool I developed, uh, which is called uh, Automated Knowledge Visualization and Assessment, ACOVIA. And um, this is basically enabling you to um, assess natural language text, but also enabling like a, a concept map assessment, so different types of assessment, and, um, and basically automating this, uh, this assessment in a quantitative way, but also providing you um, the qualitative feedback towards the, um, the assessment outcomes. <laughs> so, so this is basically the story. And um, before I start on, on that side, let's see if this slide, um, yes, it's working. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so as you obviously hear, I'm not, I'm not from Australia. Um, so originally I'm from, from Germany and uh, it's a southwestern part of Germany where the University of Freiburg is. And uh, this is where I started my career as a teacher. And so I started teacher education in history and English and then went on into, into a master's program on education science and sociology. And after that, I, I did a PhD in education technology. And uh, then I went into a further, uh, well, um, career track, which is required in Germany for being a full professor. You have to go into another PhD. And I did that in, in a more cognitive psychology era but also, of course, looking at assessment and, and uh, how technology can facilitate uh, these assessment approaches. Um, I continued my journey to another university in, in southwest of Germany, um, just 300 kilometers north of uh, Freiburg, which is Mannheim, um, also located in a nice building. As you can see in the pictures, it's, um, it's the Schloss in Mannheim, which is a, um, a very interesting building. And, and actually, the, some uh, university um, um, lecture rooms are in this building as well. So I was the department chair and professor of education science and I started developing and implementing a new study program for teacher education which was looking at competency-based um, um, uh, pre-service teacher testing uh, which included of course um, different competencies um, the teachers need to bring into the classroom so make it more authentic overall. So that was the next way to go and um, well then I started my, my international journey and, and went to the University of Oklahoma and in the United States uh, where I was uh, a Fulbright Scholar in residence and uh, I was looking at um, within the Department of Education Psychology I was looking at uh, the curriculum development and, uh, and also the assessment uh, framework for game-based learning so, so we had a large um, 
National Science Foundation grant, uh, where we looked at um, game-based learning in K-12 scenarios and uh, building assessment frameworks, where I used the tool which I will present today uh, for an assessment. And, um, and then, well, basically, my journey continued to Australia, where I started at Open Universities Australia um, in an era which is very new to Open Universities, which is applied research and learning analytics. Um, so I started building a framework on learning analytics uh, for Open Universities Australia, which is just, just being implemented. Um, that's called PASS, Personalized Adaptive Study Success, which has, of course, lots, in, lots of implications to assessment as well. So I'm, and now, um, just two weeks ago, I, I moved to Deakin University, and um, I'm now a professor and um, director for the Center for Research in Digital Learning, which is just a, a great opportunity to build a new center around research in digital learning, looking at large-scale implementation research, but also looking at all the innovative uh, research areas. That includes, of course, assessment, and we've been talking today about uh, competency-based assessments and, and what you can do with, um, well, technology-facilitated assessments in that era. So quite an interesting um, journey I'm, I'm heading into at the moment at, at Deakin, and, um, well, I'm, I'm happy to, of course, collaborate, uh, collaborate on, on all these levels, and um, just feel free to contact me in, in the future. So. Um, these are some publications I did, and um, there are references at the end of the slides, and um, the slides will be available. So I can point you to, to some current book series I'm doing. So I'm, I'm doing a Spring of Reefs uh, book series uh, where you can publish very uh, small, brief uh, research snapshot article, 50 pages. So it, it's not an expanded monograph. It, it's very short, but it's longer than a journal article, which gives you uh, the possibility to um, to have a, a more extended um, insight into a research project. But also there's the Education and Communications and Technology uh, book series looking at issues and innovations, uh, which also addresses assessment, of course, where you can publish an edited volume or monograph. And I'm also um, editing a book series on game-based learning, uh, which is just starting at the moment. And, um, and as you can see um, um, on these volumes, um, I've been in, involved into assessment as well in different eras, and also there's a book in, focusing on assessment in game-based learning I, I published last year, for example. Um, I'm also um, a new editor-in-chief of a journal, which um, has a new focus. Um, it's called Technology, Knowledge, and Learning, and uh, you're free to uh, submit your manuscript to this journal as well. So it's focusing on digital learning, gamification, learning analytics, but also on assessment. And um, I think that's, that's important for the group of, the, uh, of this webinar series. Um, um, so you can really send in snapshots, research snapshots, and uh, just projects which are starting. So we don't require full empirical um, research yet, but um, we are happy then to um, publish also um, further studies and uh, further insights into the project. So you can publish a, a series of manuscripts um, within the same domain in the journal. So that's, that's the idea of the journal as well. So that's enough, I think, for me. So uh, let's look at an agenda today. And um, briefly, I want to talk a little bit about the cognitive system and the world because I'm coming from cognitive psychology. That, that That's fascinating for me. And, uh, and then we, we are moving into a more understanding of, of assessment in terms of learning dependent progression, which means that um, that I'm looking at, um, at not a, a post uh, an, an, or a pre and a post design of assessments. I'm looking at a more formative way of assessment and showing you some, some insights here from my research. And then I move into um, the automated assessment approach, which I've developed over the last 10 years, and provide you some um, insights into empirical studies I did as well with the TULU. And, uh, and then we, we can have a look at some applications. One application would be the automated scaffolding approach. And, uh, and then I show you a, a lot around well, amount of other fields of application, which might open up a discussion in the end, uh, which I would love to have, of course. So what is the cognitive system in the world? Why, why I'm stating this? Um, well, it's an it's a easy approach. So, because um, if you're looking at um, this uh, philosopher uh, Wittgenstein and um, and his his great work *Tractatus uh, Logico Philosophicus*, um, he's stating that uh, we are picturing facts to ourselves. So, wir machen uns Bilder Tatsachen, which is basically um, looking at the kernel for an approach for assessing learning in complex domains, uh, which means that 
it encapsulates the notion of a mental model. What is the relation of the internal picture and what is really pictured from the outside world? And, and this is basically within this, um, um, this philosophical approach um, and Wittgenstein is trying to, to figure out what, what does it mean what we are looking at in the real world and how do we internalize this, this information. And again, if we have to talk about it, which is kind of an assessment in the end, what does it mean to the outside world again when we externalize our thoughts? And this is exactly where my starting point of assessment um, is, uh, is going on. So first of all, we are, we are looking at the world, and uh, this is basically an object interpretation. We are looking at a chair, we are looking at a computer, and we, we will interpret um, this object in the world in, in a very specific way, um, in a way based on our knowledge base, on our skills, and our competences. If you have another person, another learner coming in, one might be the novice, one might be the, um, the expert. We have a different uh, object interpretation, of course, uh, between this novice and expert, and, and there's uh, plenty of studies, of course, um, in the domain of novice-expert uh, differences, um, how objects are interpreted in the world, and, and what does it mean in the end for, for assessments or different types of competency assessment, et cetera, et cetera. But then, how can you transfer, of course, this expert knowledge and, 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 and this perception of the world into, into a novice and vice versa, how can you assess it, uh, what the novice already knows or what um, the novice always has on, on the set of competencies. So there's no direct carrier um, available, so we cannot directly assess this and measure it. Um, language, what we are using at the moment in this presentation is perceived but mostly needs course also interpretation. So that's another very important aspect to, to know about. So my understanding of how this is working is like this picture. So we, we have our, um, our objects in the world, we, we internalize the information from the world, and then we communicate this information back to the world, which is an externalization process. And, and then comes the educator um, or the assessor and, and tries to interpret again what is externalized. And of course, these all these functions all include biases, and we have to be aware of these biases when we talk about assessment. And this is basically what complicates all these processes. So, um, in one of the publications, and it, it's in, in, it, it's all in the references, um, I'm talking about these uh, these internalization and externalization functions uh, from the world to the cognitive structure and back again as a as a means of assessment. So, first of all, we are representing objects of the world, so that's the internalization process. And then we have to re-represent what we internalized, and that's the externalization process. And, and basically, on the end, um, well, we, we only can, can assess this re-representation because this is basically what we're looking at, uh, which makes it complicated. And um, whatever we are talking about uh, when we are talking about assessment, this is, this is basically what we have to be aware of, that, that we have, we have have a biased uh, assessment uh, approach here. <clears throat> so the next journey um, I took was um, looking at, at this theoretical model. So whenever we are coming into an assessment um, approach, um, like having to solve a task or a problem, um, there's different cognitive processes involved. On, on one side, um, there's assimilation, on the other side there's accommodation. And depending on, on the competences and, and the knowledge um, within our cognitive system, uh, first of all, we can activate a schema, which is basically the first thing humans try because humans are lazy in terms of information processing. So whenever we have to solve a problem or a task, we try to activate a schema uh, because we, we might know uh, a safe solution to this task. And, um, and this might end up in a successful solution. So we are done, um, all good. But on the other side, it could also um, cause a failure, of course. Um, as a next step, we might go into a, an accommodation process, which is also going back to PSA, of course. And, um, and there we can look at the schema modifi uh, modification, which means that, that we try to uh, tune the schema in such a way that we come to a solution. And all these solutions are, of course, um, um, individual solutions in terms of, um, of the correctness or, or incorrect um, way. So, so it's, um, it's, it's really individual uh, solutions and it's not from, from an outside perspective so far. So the assessment is coming after that, of course, looking at the solution and um, so that's the outside perspective again. 
Um, so, but if this, a schema modification is not functioning, we are trying to reorganize um, all these processes, and, and that's basically this iterative process of building a mental model and the failure of mental models and revising the mental model over and over again until we come again to a successful solution in terms of the individual perception of the solution. So this makes it very complicated, and um, this is not a a, a one-off process. It's a process which is iterative, which takes time, which is, um, well, um, taking effort, of course, and um, if you're looking at other studies like other theories, cognitive flow theory, they are all linked to these processes as well. So um, I have an example of, of such a learning process, and um, so this is in German, but it doesn't matter at all. It just represents how a student learned about statistics over the semester, and these are the most important um, um, uh, concepts um, the student was producing in a, in a blog post. And uh, so, so it's a blog post and uh, the system passed out the information from the blog post and then represented the most important um, semantic features of the blog post. And this is um, the first week and uh, the student learned about um, um, at the research project and how to um, assess the research project, um, evaluate the research project. That's basically what, what students learned within the first week. Um, and then, um, as we click through um, the weeks, you see there is more content coming in, and um, it's, it's getting suddenly it get, it's getting very complex. And um, so, so there's several weeks in between. Uh, the student suddenly starts to integrate um, all these these concepts and, and makes links and um, and makes it more more complex in in, in the understanding of of how all these um, single concepts are, are linked together. And um, of course, this is the learning process of what we expect. And uh, if we go into assessment and really go on this detailed process-oriented assessment, we can see where students might struggle and then use this information to provide them rich um, interventions, rich scaffolds, rich feedback towards um, um, a better learning success in the end and a better learning experience, of course. And that's basically what, what I'm presenting in the system as well. Um, so, so here is um, just two, um, two examples of a more novice-based learner which, uh, where you can see islands um, within, the, within the representation. And uh, on the other side, um, on the right side, you see a more advanced learner uh, which has a more integrated uh, representation of the of the knowledge base. So very interesting what you can do in, in terms of these um, assessment um, possibilities. Um, so, so this goes back to another study I did, um, and it, it, it's also published in Learning and Instruction, um, where I was looking at 10 measurement points um, um, when learners were solving problems and assessing their step-by-step um, their -step processes in, in, in solving these problems. And um, we, we identified, like, what you see in, in, in this graph, uh, a probability of change um, of different ways of um, changing the mental models over and over again until they come to a um, to a stage where the probability of change is going down. So it means there is a, a more stable schema um, developed, and, and, and the learners um, have a clear strategy to solve the problem, which which goes back to the procedural and the strategic knowledge, of course, they gain throughout the, the learning process. And um, so this is basically what we found out in, 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 that, in that study on 10 measurement points. But also um, another study published in um, 2013 in computers and education, I showed with 20 measurement points that there's the, the same process in another domain with uh, different subjects and, um, and, and also looking at the emotions uh, linked to this um, approach. So very interesting um, if you go into this small-scale um, assessment approaches of learning, dependent progression of learning. Um, so um, I'm going back to a study um, that was published in 88 and, and saying this is basically the summary of, um, of, this, of this short presentation um, so far. So two measurement points are, are better than one, but maybe not much better in the end because of the evidence I showed you and, and also the evidence I, I showed in, in these studies. Um, there's another study I want to point out by Schmitz. Uh, it's also published in Learning and Instruction um, 2006. And uh, Schmitz was looking at, uh, at uh, vocabulary learning of, of K-12 um, kids. And, uh, and he was uh, comparing the um, pre-post design um, with a more detailed measurement point design. 
and uh, identifying the measurement of change um, here, and uh, clearly identifying learning progression, but also identifying plateaus, and um, and uh, well, then losing the learned words again, and, and, and gaining again um, in, in terms of the learning process. And, and again, we can um, visualize the plateaus, um, so they stop basically learning, or then there's a, there's a specific stage in the learning process where they had to um, re-instantate uh, the schemas, for example. So, so these are inter interesting processes, and whenever you can um, use this information in terms of interventions and, and really approach the students in time, when you see there's a plateau coming up, um, then you could use, of course, specific uh, pedagogical approaches to not fall back into this um, in the, into this holes. And that's basically uh, where the strengths of, um, of all automated assessment can, can go to, which I want to point out later on. So, um, yeah, so will it um, in the same year um, uh, postulated that education assessment needs to move beyond to traditional two-wave design, and that's exactly um, what Schmidt also showed and, and what I showed in, in different other studies, um, that we have to capture the changes in learning more precisely and go into these detailed uh, learning dependent progression assessments. So, um, and this was the basis and the theoretical understanding um, I, I worked on for building a system which is capable of doing this uh, small scale and, and stepwise assessment. Um, Having a minimum um, approach in, in terms of the um, of the usability side, so so not having a, a large extended environment, but having a, a small, um, easy to handle assessment approach, um, which is also natural language um, uh, oriented, which means that you can input natural language, which means written text, and uh, and the system can pass out um, information from this written text and feed it back into um, into the environment. So um, I'm going to ex explain a little bit what uh, what the system is about and, and have some uh, studies um, around the system which I'm going to present now. So um, my approach is always, of course, assessing what learners do know rather than assessing what learners do not know. So I really want to assess what they can externalize in terms of their knowledge base and, uh, and their competencies and not assess what they don't know in terms of um, multiple choice tests, for example where you really assess what they don't know and not what they know. So they might know other things around the multiple choice test, but you cannot assess it because it's standardized and it's closed tests. So if you're um, going a more natural language approach, where the learners, of course, can externalize their, their knowledge base in terms of written texts, um, that's basically what we uh, want to approach with this ACOVIA framework uh, for the automated assessment. So um, I'm moving into, into my overall understanding of the assessment approach, which, which means that we can, can put in text um, into the system, but we also could put in like a graphical uh, visualization of your um, understanding of the, of, the, of the objects of the world, which could be a digital knowledge map or it could be a concept map, kind of these, um, these structured um, representations in a graphical way. And um, so the system cares for for all these different types of inputs. And, and you can define in the scripting language what type of input is coming into the system. Is it a natural language text, or is it a concept map in, in forms of a list? Um, so you're transferring, you're transferring the list of concepts into, into like an actual spreadsheet uh, version, and then you can upload this into the system as well. Um, so, it's a web-based um, tool, and uh, it can be uh, interfaced with uh, different other systems. So it's, it's just a matter of, of building an interface, of course, and of the system. The system is basically uh, implemented as a Perl um, system in the in the back end, and and in the front end, it's PHP and Perl as well. And um, I mainly did this work with a colleague from Germany, uh, Pablo Pianaduma. He's he's a great thinker um, in the assessment era as well, and um, and he has a very large knowledge base in, in, uh, in semantic and uh, linguistics, and, um, and he's a great colleague to work with, and, and many of the publications I'm, I'm referring to in, in these presentations are with Pablo, so whenever you get a chance to meet him, um, it's just great to talk to him as well. So this is the web um, um, surface where you can log in and you can upload your text and everything. Um, so the 
the, the major idea is basically of the system is what is closely related is also closely externalized, which is um, bringing us back to the, to the first uh, slides where I showed you these internalization and externalization uh, processes. And this is coming from, from linguistics, of course, and, and for your 66 um, developed that. And uh, so we found out in, um, in an empirical study, it was a laboratory study, um, that closer relations tend to be presented more closely within a text. So, which means that uh, when you're talking about a specific domain uh, or about specific strategies, you will link uh, specific relations um, closely in the text when you're, when you're representing the text, because this is the externalization process. Um, it's a cognitive process and it's an iterative process where you think about what, what you want to externalize. And of course, um, this is then again closely related. And this is used, um, this approach and Polio's um, idea of, um, of close relationships is then used in, in the semantic um, passing approach of the system. So we use texts which contain 300 or more words um, which uh, then build a valid basis for associate networks uh, which can be generated on the fly um, as a representation of, of, a, of a semantic um, text. Um, I will post the URL for Covia later on and so, so you can um, have a look at this as well. So the approach is Quite simple in the end. Uh, it's a natural language um, approach, which is uh, co content um, independent, which means that you can use this for whatever content you want to use. And uh, first of all, it, it, it goes through a syntactic analysis, which means whatever you bring into the system, um, there's a cleaning process uh, where you can get rid of HTML tags, for example. Um, there's a tokenizing um, process, which is looking at um, individual sentences within the whole text you're submitting. So if you have 300 words, half a page or so, um, it looks at how, how, many, how many sentences are within this text. So this is a limitation, of course, of the approach. You have to look at um, how many, um, or it needs to be proper sentences, of course. So if there is not proper sentences, the system will struggle, of course, and, and produce a biased result. So, um, but you know, in, in the academic uh, context, we uh, mostly have texts which, uh, which follow these rules um, clearly, and it, it's a matter of instructing uh, the assessment approach as well. Then the next step is a tagging process where you go into the text corpus and, and look at um, individual um, um, words within the text, which means that you identify the nouns, you identify the words, the adjective, et cetera, et cetera, and, um, and then looking at uh, how many of these words are available. And then you're going uh, as an expert into a stemming process, which is looking at um, the word stem of, of the words included in the text. Um, this is helpful to get a rid, for example, of flexions. And um, so if you have house and houses, um, it, 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 it goes back to the word stem, of course, and then you can have a better analysis and assessment of what is represented in the text. And then comes the magic, basically um, building association measures out of this um, um, syntactic analysis. So you define the, the length of the sentence because we're looking at um, uh, um, nouns and, um, and objects um, from the world which are closely related, of course. So we're looking at the, at the sentence length. We're looking at pairs of words which are represented within the sentence, but also throughout the whole text. And, and then we are calculating the distance of pairs of words and sentences, which means that we're looking at um, all these uh, pairs of words within one single sentence, but also throughout the sentences. And this is producing um, two very distinct measures. One is the distance measure, which means that um, how many words are in between a, a, a pair of words. And the other one is the weight. So uh, what is the shortest distance between this pair of words um, throughout the text? And then you can build a hierarchy of, uh, of all these um, of all this semantic information within the text. And, uh, and this hierarchy is then used for representing the most frequent um, concepts and uh, the most frequent uh, propositions within the text basis. And this is basically um, your assessment um, um, approach. So um, this is an, uh, an example of a list which is of course, in a, in a computer-based data, um, database um, store. So, so you have the, the individual concepts in, in the first two columns. Then you have the distance. Um, so that's the sum of, of, of all distances. So, so the first two, um, uh, the first row is basically the, the most important concepts and, 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 and 
the further down you go, the less important um, the, the concepts get in terms of their uh, relationships. So this is basically the, the starting point for the analysis. And, um, and then you can build something like this. Um, so this is a representation of the, the hierarchy of, of concepts and uh, propositions. And uh, what you see as red lines, these are the, the most important concepts, so the highest weights and the shortest distances. So road, um, um, the health and education, so that's the strongest um, uh, relationship and because this is, um, uh, I think it's, it's coming from a, an insurance company and looking at health insurance and, um, and also on, on investments. Um, so so um, looking at this on its own, you can work on, 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 on the uh, on an assessment approach here on a qualitative basis, just looking at what are the most frequent um, um, words used and, and what is the what is the most frequent um, uh, proposition and relationship of these words. Uh, the numbers on of, on the lines um, are relationships, uh, so the strengths of relationships um, on, on on that level. So what we also produce. In, uh, besides this, this graphical representation of text is um, similarity measures. Um, and there are seven similarity measures. Um, they are between zero and one. Zero would be a um, exclusion, and uh, one is basically identity. So, so if you have uh, two representations, like the one I showed you, and um, they are totally ident um, identical, all the measures would be one. And uh, if they're totally different, of course, this is um, uh, quantifying then exclusion of, of both representations. So in more detail, um, we can look at the structure of the representation, but also we can look at the semantic um, level of the representation. And I, I go through these uh, these measures briefly um, in terms of the uh, time constraints we have in this session. Um, so the structural measures are four measures, uh, which look at um, at the surface and the complexity of the representation, and the con um, and the semantic measures look more more on, on a content uh, aspect, which means the, the individual concepts uh, which are used and, and the propositions, which means a concept linked to another concept. And, um, and then there's a balancing semantic measure as well, which helps you to identify um, a balanced understanding of the, the used um, um, semantic content within the representations. And this is basically all these seven measures um, are, um, can, can be built up um, and, and compared to, for example, to an expert solution or to a textbook solution. So we can say, okay, this is, this is the ideal um, solution to a problem, for example, or this is the group's content of a problem solution. And we can then um, build these similarity measures um, around individuals, but also comparing that um, against um, the, the expert solution, for example. So um, Acovia on its own is, is not um, set for, for any training sets like um, other um, natural language processing approaches. So it's just using the, the, the information you're feeding into the system and, uh, and Acovia is working with that material on its own. So there's no self-learning or training uh, required in, in, in prior stages, but also uh, the system is of course not learning. What you can do of course is um, include other interfaces to Acovia, for example, um, 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 synonym workbooks and um, um, other other features, and, and, and there can be also, of course, um, training sets generated, which then will be a better reference model for um, assessment tasks uh, you're going to specify in a in a in a longer term. Um, so there's lots of open possibilities because the system has uh, has many open aspects as well. Um, so uh, very briefly only in, in, into into these uh, measures. So the first structural measure is looking at the at the size of a representation. It's a very um, um, intuitive measure, I think. It's just calculating the, the number of propositions within the representation. Um, then the next one is the graphical matching measure, which is looking at the, the complexity of of the representation. So. So we are building the spanning tree of the representation and then looking at the longest, shortest path of the spanning tree. So this is coming from graph theory and, and looking at the, basically the diameter of the, of the spanning tree. And this helps you to, uh, to identify if there is a, a, a very complex representation or is it limited in, in 
important in terms of the argumentation uh, structure, uh, what you're representing um, on that side. And if you're thinking about a concept map, you can easily um, visualize what, what that would mean if, if you have a, a less complex a concept map versus a more uh, a more complex uh, concept map. And if you start comparing this on, on the structural level, you can learn a lot about the representation of individual learners at, at specific stages to, uh, during the learning process, of course. Um, another one is the gamma matching, which is looking at the connectedness of the representation. So how many concepts um, are uh, coming into one, uh, one uh, or having one link, for example, or several links. So this, this gives you a, a good understanding of the interconnectedness of the whole argumentation, of the whole representation. Um, looking at, um, at the last uh, structural measure is the structural matching, which is looking at the inner structure. And so it decomposes the whole representation into submodels. And then it runs an analysis of all the submodels and compares individual submodels to, um, to a um, another feature set of, um, of, of submodels, and then identifies um, if there is a, a, a pattern um, which can be identified, which might be very specific to a misconception. And um, so if, there, if this pattern can be identified, of course, then we can uh, really point to a, a specific misconception um, links which, um, which do not um, make sense in terms of the content understanding, but also on, on the logic side. And this helps us to um, identify these misconceptions on, on the slide, of course. Looking at the semantic side, um, there's also a very simple way of, um, of doing some uh, semantic similarity of concepts. Um, just looking at the um, at representation M and N, uh, we are looking at, um, at the, the word stems, of course, again. So, and, and then we are looking at um, what, what concept is similar uh, in, in the semantic um, way. Um, one limitation here is, of course, the, the correct um, spelling. So um, there needs to be a spell st uh, checking process before this uh, approach is started. Otherwise, um, you might have um, a problem in, in terms of identifying the, the correct spelled words. Um, and the next thing is the proposition matching, which is looking at uh, propositions. Um, it's um, similar, a similarity of uh, two concepts linked, linked together. So this is basically a more complex semantic understanding of, of the representation, which helps us to, um, to get a better understanding if there is a, 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 this, this more complex understanding and not, not only a, a semantic understanding of a specific individual words, but also how they are uh, connected uh, to each other, so more than the logics behind, um, behind the, um, the semantic structure. And then there's a, a combination of both measures which help to identify um, a more um, rich uh, information about the individual concepts, but also on the propositions. Um, if you want to have more insights into that, um, um, I, I'm going to refer to these um, publications at the end, or just approach me via email or contact me in other ways, and I'm happy to have a conversation with you on more details on, on these levels of, of assessments. Um, uh, just, so, uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, Jeff here. I just wondered, there was a couple of um, questions there uh, in the text chat uh, box, and I just wondered whether it would be useful to address those as we're going through. Um, yeah, there was one. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can, can you see those there, the last two? Yes, I saw that, yes, yeah. Let's, let's go for the first one and uh, from Richard. Thanks, Richard. And um, so um, Richard is saying, so does that mean that uh, for every new uh, assessment session, content will be required to be added to COVID prior to the exam to ensure that the database has the most appropriate data in it? Well, yes, this is basically what you define. Um, um, so, so you can define the, the reference model uh, which you're going to use for, for your assessment. So um, if you base an assessment on, on a textbook, uh, you might use, use the information from the textbook, but that, that's only looking at, at the semantic context. Uh, on the other side, you could also generate a more complex representation um, as a reference, uh, which is also looking at the, at the complexity of the understanding of a, of a problem solution. And, um, and so you're feeding um, the system with this information and use that as a benchmark uh, towards your assessment. So that's basically how it works. But you can also use um, a peer assessment, of course. So, um, so you're using all the input um, the peers are bringing into, into the system and then can use this um, as a, an, an, a reference base 
for um, for further analysis. So, so there are different ways into the system, of course, and that makes it more flexible in my understanding. And uh, so there's plenty of applications from from that side. And it's basically what you design as an assessment environment, how you use the system. So it's it's basically opening um, lots of uh, possibilities on that side. Um, So um, argument, so when I'm saying argument, uh, so this is from Penny, when, when Dirk says argument, does he mean the actual thesis of, of the text passage or is he speaking more abstractly? Um, well, yes, it, it can be both, but um, I don't know where, where you um, got that uh, notion of argument, but basically I'm, I'm, I'm really looking at the, in, at the semantic content of, of the representation. So I'm, I'm looking at, um, at at the, at the content of the text, so it's, it's not an abstract way we are looking at, at, a, at a holistic way of the text, we are really going into the word level. And that's, I think, the powerful way of assessment. It's, um, it's, it's looking at, them, at, of course, also on a holistic way because of, on the structure of the, of the text, et cetera, et cetera, but we can also go into, into the word level. And, and then we can um, go into a, into a higher level of, um, um, of uh, the understanding, looking at propositions, for example, or the balanced uh, semantic understanding, which is uh, going into a more complex understanding. So, so it has different levels, and um, and that makes it, from my understanding, also a very interesting um, that you can approach different levels of assessment on that side, and and you define what what you want to get out of the system. So it's it's really uh, providing you uh, different aspects here. So um, yeah, let me just quickly um, go into into the technical framework. Um, so the system is um, is feeding um, um, into an upload server where you just log in. So this is basically a website. Um, I'm gonna um, send you the URL so you can send in uh, raw data. And you get an email which is um, saying um, the raw data is validated and uh, and a and then it, it's sent to the analysis server. Um, it's doing the analysis in the back end, and then it's uh, sending it back to the to the upload server and uh, sends you a, a, another email saying your analysis is ready, and you can you can download uh, your results. So that's basically the current technical framework of the server. And um, so so this is um, again you can come in with text files um, and also graphical representation which are in list form, and um, you zip all this information, upload it, it's validated. And um, if it's validated, then it, it goes into analysis. If not, you get an error protocol and you have to upload it again, of course, make it right. And um, within the analysis, um, you get your visualization if you want to and, and, and all your quantitative indicators. And you, you get a, a zip file again to download where all the results are stored in and all the graphs and everything. So, so that's basically how it works. Um, so. Um, yeah, this is the output what you get. So you can get a comparison. So that's the similarity comparison. That's all the um, these seven measures uh, where you can see what is similar and what's not similar between zero and one um, in terms of all the, the text you upload, for example. So that's an Excel file, which then can be imported into um, further statistical analysis in R statistics or in SPSS, whatever you use. And you get also um, the graphical visualizations as um, ready to print um, quality as SVG, but also as a, as a PNG um, representation, and you can define what you want to get out of the system. There's a protocol, um, making a summary, and that's basically all what you what you get as a download file. Um, this is the scripting, so so you have to script the the, the, the system um, at the current stage. So so you use an Excel file, and there are some easy uh, scripting um, codes like EN for Eng in English and DE for German. So the, s the system actually works in two languages at the moment because we're using German and, and English uh, language passing um, systems. Um, and you define the, the text files you're uploading in your system, and you define a number to the text files because you refer to these numbers, the model numbers, later on in your in your analysis script, and that looks like this. Um, so you can say in a comment, I want to visualize um, the, the text 1 to 11, which means that you just produce a graph out of the text. And um, so for every graph 1 to 11, you get a, a PNG file having the weights on. The second um, um, row would be you get also a PNG file, but uh, it's not weighted. So, so this is a, another representation. And there's other scripting um, comments. And I have a manual for this as well, so I can share the manual with you as well. Um, 
maybe we can um, upload it with the presentation um, so you can um, get an understanding of all these um, different um, scripting um, comments. And it's not more than what you see on the screen, so it's very easy scripting. And it helps you to, to get around very quickly uh, what you really want to do. Um, so I sent you the URL to the, to the website. Um, these are just some screenshots. And this is the representation without um, screenshots, uh, without the, the weights. So, so it's just uh, used also for, for um, interventions, for example. So I use this in studies um, using this graph exactly for interventions. And again, the, the weighted uh, representation. Um, and this is the, the quantitative indicators, how it looks like, and, and this is easily um, used then for, uh, for further statistical analysis, for example, but also for feedback uh, functions as well. Um, I did uh, several studies with my colleagues um, looking at, um, at the reliability and the validity of the system, and it's all published, and, and it was all very successful in terms of the reliability. So, um, but also on, on validity, we're looking at uh, convergent and divergent validity of the individual measures. So we wanted to have uh, convergent validity, of course, of the semantic and the structural measures. And um, this is basically um, how, how this um, um, showed up in almost 2 million uh, data sets. Uh, we were successful in, in, in showing this um, validity as well. And that's published in 2010 in Education Technology Research and Development. So uh, just uh, quickly um, at the end of the presentation, one uh, insight into a application. So I developed a further instrument based on what I just presented, which is called text-guided automated self-assessment, where students are enabled to self-assess their essay writing. So the idea was um, students are left alone while they are writing an essay throughout the semester, trimester, whatever, um, and uh, get feedback at the end when, when the essay is, is finished. Um, so I wanted to give and empower the students to, to go into an automated self-assessment uh, approach and um, get feedback whenever they want it. Um, so feedback on the fly through the system and um, informing them how they are progressing over time when they are writing their, their thesis. So, um, so there were several stages set uh, throughout the semester when the students could upload um, their essays. And, uh, and get a feedback in terms of a, a, a graphical dynamic, um, a graphical uh, visualization like the, like the graphs I showed you, but also get a feedback in a dynamic text. Um, this was coming from a phrase database, so predefined phrases, um, but also uh, feed it from the quantitative indicators produced by the system. So uh, we were going through all these processes and then providing the, uh, the students feedback in a, um, in a web-based um, environment. And that's basically how it looked like. Uh, it's not, not fancy graphical design um, because it was an experimental um, environment, but still the students used it. And uh, what you see here in the, in the red box, this is the dynamic text feedback which was drawn from this phrase database and actually using um, the semantic information the, the students were having produced in their essays and, um, and also uh, stating these semantic information within this dynamic text. So we had variables um, which were then using the, the student's individual text and, and feeding it back to the student again. And then they, they also received a graphical uh, representation about the most uh, frequent terms they used. And, um, and there was another version where, where they could compare um, their current um, essay status with the peers, but also with uh, the expert solution um, to, to an essay. So, so there were various um, 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 information um, available. There were some studies around this, and um, I don't go into, into all the details, but we were looking at the, the effectivity and the um, estimated effectivity of, of the system and looking at different levels and how, how the student um, um, estimated uh, this. This is one study where I did um, this uh, measurement approach on five measurement points and, and looked at the, the text feedback with um, the, only the text uh, without the, the visualization and uh, one feedback, of course, also with the visualization and looking at how they estimated the effectivity of the system um, when comparing uh, visualization versus no visualization. And uh, well, clearly the, there was a effect on uh, using different instruments, of course, and there was a clear effect on, on the change of effectivity uh, whenever they received a, um, a graph. So, so the box plots, um, which um, have a higher um, effectivity of the system, 
at um, session one, session three, and session five. That's basically where the students receive the graphical representation and the text. And um, session two and four, they only receive the text. So they, they estimated the efficiency of the system better, of course, in, in terms of the, of the graphical representation because they, um, they could really figure out what's the meaning of that. It also had the effect on the, on the study interest. And um, again, the, the, the graphical representation and non-graphical representation have significant differences on that level. So it really works when they also get this graphical representation, which is automated based on, on the text only. And that's just made on the fly, of course. Um, so another, and maybe this is the last, before we can have a, a conversation, um, there's plenty of fields of application, and I had conversations over the last years, and uh, we were looking at team-based learning, for example, novice expert um, comparison, looking at different domains and, and looking at how the domains are, have distinguishing features and, and how you can address these in assessment scenarios. You can use this um, as feedback mechanisms, of course, of self-assessment and for peer assessment. So there's plenty of applications, and I would be happy to have a conversation with you about this and uh, what you see as, as the next step of the system, because I want to, of course, um, evolve the system and, and, and make it uh, more usable for, for a more public domain, of course. So from my understanding, still automation is not an end in itself, but um, it can really be meaningful in specific settings where we have large sets of, of data and um, and also um, uh, where groups are under investigation which are large. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the PISA study or, or other studies. And um, well, there's, there's also clear evidence that we will have practical applications um, looking at the domain of learning analytics, for example. Uh, we should go into uh, and understanding what does assessment within this domain of learning analytics mean, what is the informative feedback back to the learner um, if we collect large amounts of data, and what is the semantic content of that data, and not only the behavioral data we are using from, from log files. And that's basically my passion about assessment, looking at the semantic content and looking at really what the learners know rather than what they don't know. And um, I think that, that might be a, a starting point for our conversation now. Thank you very much, Dirk, uh, for that. Um, and now we'll open it up for questions or comments from everyone. Um, so I can see Dirk's putting up some references there. I uh, wondered, Dirk, I think people uh, might be interested in some URLs uh, as well for um, for the system, or maybe some you know some examples or some output from the system. You've shown that there. You did mention the manual uh, as well. I wondered whether you um, could put the URL in the uh, t in the text chat um, box. Of for course. Um, I'm I'm happy to do that. Um, I have just to um, get it right. That's the thing I have to do. Um, but I'm happy to share this link. And so what what you have to do is create a user and choose me as as the um, as the reference person, so it's it's asking you to select your sponsor, and so you you add you select me as a sponsor, so that's the default setting anyway, and then and then you're free to log in. And um, what I what I have to do is uh, basically also share a link or maybe share the file with Matthew um, um, would be best to uh, to the manual, which helps you to step through the process of of scripting and um, and giving you an understanding um, how how you could use the system as well. Any other questions, comments? Oh yeah, um, the idea of putting this into MOOCs. Um, I was presenting at a conference uh, at a, um, um, 
um, two weeks ago here in Melbourne, and I was talking about um, the application of, of the system in discussion forums. Um, so uh, providing the, uh, the possibility of um, doing a semantic analysis of uh, what is, what is uh, written in, in, in discussion forums and uh, going into the, into the content of, um, of discussion forums and, and looking at, the, of course, uh, what students um, are talking about and what is important in terms of, um, of, the, of the learning um, processes within the discussion forums and identify um, specific uh, features within the discussion forums. So that's a possibility, of course, to use the system as well, and also to uh, help the instructors who are working in a MOOC, for example, what you mentioned uh, early on, uh, to, to focus on specific topics which are um, well discussed in the discussion forum, because if you have uh, 10,000 students, um, and it, it takes a, a lot of um, effort to go through all the discussions and, and, and moderate this in a, in a, in a very um, uh, sophisticated way. So having, having a system like this and helping you to visualize um, um, interconnected um, um, concepts and semantic understanding, that might be a good way to, to start a facilitation process as well. So, so it's not only about the learner, it's also about the facilitators within environments which can be um, using the system. Did I miss something? Yes, please contact me, Alex. Not a problem at all. Uh, Dirk, I wonder about different types of assessment tasks uh, that people can set um, because with, um, you know, with some tasks that they set, they actually want the students to be creative and perhaps innovative in terms of the solution um, that they're providing. So the, the text would not be necessarily what we call sort of standardised responses or standardised um, approaches to a response. And I wonder whether you've done any work in areas where you actually expected students to come up with something completely different or a different way of describing something um, from what would have been, been considered as a normal standardized way of responding. Yeah, so there's clearly possibilities on, on, on the structural side to, to identify patterns. Um, so so that's, a, that's an approach which I, I, I don't um, have any empirical evidence towards that. And uh, what I did was looking at different domains and, and, and identifying um, students responding, um, so the same student responding to a, to a problem in, uh, in mathematics, in history, and in biology, and looking if there is a similarity patterns within the responses. Um, so that's something which I did on, on, a, on a very basic research level. And, um, but um, I haven't um, looked at, for example, open, open problems and, uh, and going into more details on that. So that might be an interesting research project to, to follow up and, 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 and see if the system is capable of, uh, of, of handling open problem um, solution or um, well, steps towards a solution and um, uh, within ill-defined problems, for example. So um, when we're talking, whenever we are talking about competencies, that might be something uh, which, is, uh, which is relevant as well. Okay, so other questions from people? Uh, I, I saw that um, um, looking at USB stick, uh, is it bootable? So at the moment it's, it's working on, on a server only because um, it requires, of course, the, the natural language uh, parsing um, um, database in, in the background. So that's why it's, it's, it's not a standalone uh, function. It's, it, it always needs the, uh, the web. Uh, interface, but um, you can collect the data and then upload it and and, and get it back as a, as a result. Um, so so that's that's always possible, of course. Oh, well, there's there's not a big database because um, the information is destroyed always. So um, so we have a. Um, a very small database which is uh, basically filled with the information in, in the analysis server and then um, after the analysis is done and, and the ticket is, is produced for download, 
uh, the information is destroyed in the database again. So, so it's not big, and um, it's uh, because it's only the analysis process is only uh, related on on the data you're feeding into the system. Um, it keeps it very small. Um, that's the that's the smart move on, on on the database side. If you would expand this, of course, to a, a training data set, um, that would require, of course, um, a different uh, setup of the database, and that would grow the database, of course, in, into an unlimited <laughs> space. I think. Um, well, um, make something effective in, in terms of um, of looking at um, imp implementing it in a real uh, learning setting. Um, well, it's 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 a matter of defining the interface, and um, um, so how can you how can you um, in interface with uh, what you're using as an assessment um, approach? So is it is it like I said, a discussion forum? And how can you get the information from the discussion forum out of the system and then into into the into the other system? So it's a matter of defining these interfaces between the two systems, and um, so that's that's all we need uh, basically, and um, that would be a work to be done, um, but not very much complicated because on on the assessment. Um, server side, it's all defined and it's all um, clearly structured. So it's just a matter of looking at the other side where you do the assessment, the real assessment, and um, and you define basically the output of what what your assessment is producing, which needs to fit, of course, to the uh, structure of the Covia framework, and and that's basically all we have to do. Okay, any other questions from people? Oh yes, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, different other tools, of course, in this space, and um, they have similar approaches, um, language-oriented approaches, and um, well, yes, um, it's a matter of um, at, of empirical testing, from my understanding, because I'm, I'm coming from a very rich uh, quantitative research background. Um, I want to provide empirical evidence that it's working as well. So, so that's basically what what I'm saying. My system um, has been tested on that side. So, and um, and I'm looking for several collaborations, of course, always, and, and to um, well, bring this further, this project. Sure. Okay, Dirk, then what we might do is to say thank you very much uh, for your presentation today. That's been excellent. Uh, I think you've certainly stimulated people's thinking about this, and it's great to actually see a very formal approach uh, to this. So thank you very much, uh, Dirk, for that. And um, if there's no other questions, we'll just say thank you to all our participants uh, tonight as well. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye, Dirk. And just a reminder, everyone, that uh, this has been recorded and will be available on the Transforming Assessment website. So if any of your colleagues uh, were not able to make it today, then make sure you let them know about it and uh, that they can go and look at this whenever they wish. And uh, keep an eye out for our 2014 series. We're starting to put that together. So today was the last one, obviously, for 2013. So um, keep keep looking at the Transforming Assessment website when we'll have next year's program up. So thank you and goodbye to everyone. Uh, Matthew, we can stop the recording now too.